Alright, hello YouTube, this is T1 Glistener Elf. Normally I would just show you the <laughs> show you the gameplay video itself, and we do our own commentary and whatnot. However, in this case, I'm over with my good friend TJ, the guy that you're seeing on the left, who's going to be running Infect. He's gonna be the T1 Glistener Elf for this video. And there's a TV in the room, and his daughter's watching TV. Yeah, there, there's a lot of sound going from that, so one, I imagine that would be annoying. Uh, two, it can get me hit with, you know, a, a copyright claim, or, or worse, they could block the video. That's happened on a few of mine where the music itself is, is blocked. Actually, I guess that's only happened on one of mine. So, to avoid all that, I'm doing a nice little overlay here, a commentary overlay. This is actually the first video, I think, that I've ever done commentary on like this, and it's by myself, so I, I imagine it won't be quite as effective as Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan, or Gabby Sparks, Louis Scott Vargas, LSV, shoutouts. But, oh, okay, so you can see what I'm on. So I'm on Merfolk. Uh, he's on Infect. Starts out with the uh, the T1 Ink Moth Nexus. And here, yeah, it, it looks like a Merfolk deck. <laughs> it really does. There's the, your Cavern of Souls. There's your Silvergill Adept. I'm about to reveal who even knows what. I think that's a Mirror Regery. The, the glare is... The lighting here isn't excellent, I admit. Uh, I think it depends, so if you took them out of the sleeves, they'd be fine, but there is a fan light uh, just above us, and it's uh, it's throwing us off a bit. There's a Muta Vault, and so yeah, all of this, except maybe that card on the left, looks like a regular Merfolk list. Uh, you, you'll see, though. You'll see. We have uh, some shenanigans going on, so he's going to fetch a Wooded Foothills here, pay us one life, get a forest. I'm... I think it's an Ikruclaw mirror he's going to go after first. Watch it not be, not watch it be a Necropede. So his list has four Glistener Elves, I think it's two Necropede, three Ikruclaw mirror, three Blight Mamba, and of course the four Ink Moth Nexi. So, yeah, they are tapped, Jay, they are tapped, you, <laughs> you Doom Cop, <laughs> you, you, you idiot, alright. But yeah, I don't know what we were talking about that distracted me, but yeah, I just kind of played the Silver Go add up for zero mana for some reason. Uh, but yeah, there's Necropede. Alright, so we know what he's trying to do. He's trying to get the two for one here, because Necropede, when it dies, distributes a minus one, minus one counter. So you see two one toughness creatures, you know what, what's going on. Uh, there is a Muta Vault. I don't think that really, if he knew about that, I don't think that would change his play though. Because um, he could still one for one with a Vault if I want to get a little frisky. There's an Ether Vial right on time. Ether Vial right on time, as always. For me. Alright, but instead, we're going to start off with a Lord here. And this is a main phase Lord, because again, of course, I don't have an Ether Vial on two to pull any flash shenanigans. And this way, the best that he can do is one for one with the Necropede, if he wants to take out a Curse Catcher or a Silvergill Adept. Um, and he wouldn't be able to take out the Lord, because of course the Lord isn't attacking here. So this, this puts him in a slightly harder spot. And this is one neat trick that Merfolk has against, uh, against Infect. But he's going to block the Silver Go Adept. And at this point, I'm pretty sure he's going to take out the uh, Adept, but no, he puts a counter on Lord. And I imagine what's going on, maybe he has another Necropede and he's just thinking, well, I can take out the Lord on the next go. Uh, of course, this is Merfolk. This is Lord.deck, so... It is risky to do something like that. I could just have yet another one. Now, because he's using the list that I used to 4-0 at FNM, he doesn't have any mainboard creature uh, kill spells. He doesn't have any dismember, uh, which he is desperate for right now. And he, and he tells me somewhere around here that he is. I don't play Eric is. There's the dismember. Or not dismember. There's the necropede. And there's me saying, you know, I, I probably should have played that card. If you're thinking, T1 Glistener Elf, why didn't you do that? Yeah. Uh, sleep? Or lack thereof? I guess I have a little bit of time to... Okay, no, no, I don't. I'll tell you later. Because uh, th there's something you don't see in every <laughs> Merfolk deck. What on earth is Yavamaya Coast doing in a Merfolk deck? Because that is legitimately a card I intended to have. It's a four of in the deck. Yavamaya Coast makes all of the colors that we need in this deck. So obviously it's going to make blue, 
you see all the blue going on. It makes green because I have Branch Walker. Oh, and there we go. There's our mirror Reedry. And it makes colorless. And yes, actual factual colorless mana, not generic mana, colorless mana is necessary for some cards in the deck. Six in the main board. And you probably already know where this is going. This is a Warping Whale Spatial Contortion list. Taking out cards like Dismember. Uh, so Dismember, of course, Creature Kill Spell, Warping Whale, and Spatial Contortion are my answers instead. And if it weren't for what the meta is like, I would say that Warping Whale, at the very least, is definitely better than Dismember. The trick, though, one, again, the mana cost. Two, Gurmog Angler, Tassiger, and Reality Smasher get hit by Dismember um, and don't get hit by Warping Whale or Spatial Contortion. But the flexibility of the former and the reliability of the latter make me want to at least try them out. And with Lord Effects, you can actually get to a point where Spatial Contortion won't kill one of your creatures, but rather will pump it. And because it's an instant, you can do it to whichever one isn't blocked, so on and so forth. So he is in a tough spot because he won't get to take out that Lord of Atlantis in one go like he had perhaps been hoping, not without a pump spell. Okay, so to what I was saying earlier, you see the Aether Vial still stranded in hand? Yeah, I'm, I'm about to cast it, but I have, I, I have another job. I'm an American, I work 50 hours a week, literally 50 hours a week, so that's, that's just what happens. You get a little sleep deprived. It's not ideal, but that's the way it goes. Alright, what on earth are we talking about here? <laughs> Just, okay, so he ticks it up, distributes the counter, take, puts it on Lord of Atlantis, and there's the Aether Vial at last. I, I said it was late when it showed up in my hand, it's even later now. It was on quite the break. Alright, pass the turn back, see what he draws. He must be at a dearth of pump spells here. It, he has to be. Right, but I know he has an Ink Moth Nexus, and sadly I can't block that, so... And we're, we're correcting damage. Again, who knows what we were talking about. We, we have a good time, he and I. We, you know, have some fun. I see a Blight Mamba in his hand, too. So yeah, it may just be he has a bunch of creatures. And that's it. So Icar Claw Mirror is interesting because it gets plus two, plus two upon being blocked, not upon blocking. And so it won't help him very much on this next turn, this one that we're about to take. I'm uh, about to hit the trigger for Aether Vial. I mean, I might as well. Maybe it'll never matter since it's coming out so late, but I might as well. Alright, draw that Cavern, I believe. That's what it looks like. Yep, Cavern. Naming Lurgoyf. I would say naming Fungusar, but those have been uh, changed to dinosaurs now. Alright. So, probably another Regery, I would think, since I'm reaching for that third land. Or maybe it's Lord and then a 3-drop. Alright, let, let's figure this out. And while I'm thinking uh, over in the past, I'm going to have some tea in the present. Alright. Alright, I've made up my mind. Maybe. Yeah, we're going to start off with a re-jury. <laughs> I have a re and a Lord of Atlantis, and I think I'm just supposed to run both of them out, is what's, what's being debated here. So, okay, so it was the untap, tr or the tap trigger I was needing to figure out. Okay, so if I play Regery and then Lord of Atlantis, then I get three tap and untap triggers. Um, and I untap the Mutavault, you see. So it's Regery, tap the Ichorclaw, Lord, tap the Forest, and untap my Mutavault. Now why Mutavault? I'm Hellbent, doesn't really matter. And he's scooping him up. Yep, there we go. So there's that game. And I didn't even then get a, a look at his hands. But uh, I, I think we figured that out. Okay, so here comes game two. Let's see. So even though we're, we're just casually playing good friends, he and I, 
kitchen table magic. He is, uh, we're, we're shuffling seriously. I don't know why. I do it out of force of habit. I imagine it's probably the same for him. Or he was doing that cut, that two pile cut. Back and forth. Alright, so you see he has, is that six cards in hand? No, surely not. I'm seeing a Glistener Elf hanging out in his hand with a Might of Old Crosa. Alright, so this is going to be... Oh, okay. There is uh, one land in my opening hand. Am I keeping? Alright, so Pendlehaven Glistener Elf. Good. Cavern. Into Curse Catcher. I will gladly make the trade here, or at least make him use a pump spell. There is zero doubt in my mind that that's what I'll do. Now, he is running a four mutagenic growth list. So I do have to be careful of the turn two play, the turn two kill. Not every infect deck does run them, actually. And if you don't run mutagenic growth in modern, barring other shenanigans, it means that you are a turn three deck, not a turn four. Now, granted, mutavolt, or uh, mutavolt, mutagenic growth is sometimes a really bad card, in part because it doesn't save you from lightning bolts. Um, and so in a Lightning Bolt heavy meta, Mutagenic Growth is frankly just really not that good. Uh, on its own, it doesn't do enough. So he's going to play his Forest and main phase a Might of Crosa here, of course. Yeah, I could sack the Curse Catcher to counter it. And I don't know why I did that, because I think... Now, maybe there's some Apostle's Blessing shenanigans here, but I, I think it's better to block so that I don't have to worry about... Yeah, yeah, that, that had to have been a misplay. D did I just forget about the Pendlehaven, or what did I... How did I mess that up? Hmm. I... I don't know. That was just a misplay. Plain and simple. Just a misplay. Straight up. Okay, so Cavern and Unclaimed Territory, uh, which, by the way, Unclaimed Territory also, like Yavamaya Coast, makes all the colors I need in the deck. And, like, Cavern of Souls makes all the colors I need. Uh, so that's great. There's Spell Skype, but there's an Ink Moth Nexus, so too little, too late. I only need one click from uh, Ink Moth to do me in. So he's going to put two counters on Spell Skype. And I imagine that Curse Catcher mis misplay is the kind of thing that as I play Merfolk more, will happen less frequently. I really don't know why I tried to do that. Um, he does have Rancor. That may have been what ran through my mind. I know he's a triple Rancor list. And so I may have been thinking, you know, if I, if I let this stay out, he's going to play a Rancor, and then he'll just get over me anyway. So that, that might have been what crossed my mind. I'm not sure, but... Yeah, that probably is, because I played this deck to a 4-0 at F, and that, that's on camera, that's on YouTube, you can see that. So that's almost certainly what happened, I think. Okay, so he's, I'm going to block the Glistener Elf, and I'm going to Warping Whale the Ink Moth Nexus. So, Ink Moth Nexus, uh, now if he, if he plays this correctly, he's safe. He needs to Pendlehaven Pump the Ink Moth Nexus, and he's good. He's checking it to make sure that's how it works. And indeed, the condition does have to be true when it resolves. So, if he Pendlehaven pumps here, I'm just dead. But I'm going to make him do it. And he got me. <laughs> okay. That, that's fine. We, he and I are essentially playtesting here. And if that's, a, if that's something that comes up when he plays later on in a serious tournament, well, then I've, I've maybe helped him out just a touch. So... And, and that's fine by me, because he's the one that's actually going to tournaments these days. I'm not. I, uh, I don't get the chance to. I, I sold my collection, and maybe at some point I'll start working it back up. I, at some point I will. I just don't know how long that'll be. Um, you know, there's some really great people, TJ included, uh, that have helped me get to where I am right now, and I really need to pay them back first. So, here we go. Let's see. I'm looking to see if I have a few cards in particular in my hand. Let's see what's in there. Can't... Tilt your hand down just a little bit there, T1. Come on. 
Is that a is that a skite? Come on, a little more. Okay, never mind. Well, so much for that. <laughs> uh, and he's he's deciding, I guess. Perhaps it's one of those borderline hands. And okay, okay. So he decided not, and I decided not too. Apparently. All right. Didn't get a good look at that hand. Maybe it was a one lander. Maybe the lands were making a, were, were mute vault. That happens as a, as an infect player. That is a way that you can lose. You uh, you keep a hand with ink moth nexus, but no colored lands. Gotta watch that. Why would you? In a, a mono green list, you might do it just because you can play your Icker Claw Mirror, your Necropede, uh, ink, ink Moth Nexus. That, that's really the only, those are the only reasons I can think of. Uh, you think that the hand is keepable now and you hope that it just evolves to what you need. Alright, but he and I are both going to six and a half. I like to count the Vancouver Mulligan as half a card. All right. It has a land. It has a mutavolt. So at the very least, we know that we're safe on the first. Oh yeah, we forgot to do our scries. Kitchen table magic. I see with my little eyes. Is that? Ah, uh, come on, move, turn it back. I was trying to see if I saw a Spell's Guide or a Chalice or something. And Chalice against Infect, needless to say, is a really good card. Now, obviously, since I'm Merfolk, I can't get it out in time to hit the T1 Glistener Elf, but we are going to Spell's Guide to uh, do something. Now, <laughs> since I'm on the play, you don't get one turn to double mutagenic growth me, bro. <laughs> also, I just misplayed. E even with Rancor, it probably was better to keep that up for a block. Um, I don't know. When, when you're you're banking on a card, at most it could have been a four of, which is a forty percent chance to be in the opening hand. Uh, I know, no, it, it was it was wrong for me to have done that. Playing around Rancor was not right there, especially when he had the one extra mana. The idea though is if I don't sack the Curse Catcher here, he plays Rancor and, and I can't uh, counter it. Okay, so I'm over here saying I'll take one. I'm not putting one on the Spell Sky right now. I'm just going to take an Infect counter. And that's a little bit risky with the Ink Moth Nexus there, because he's a Cathedral of War list, so I do have to be careful of that. But it leaves my Spell Skite up for uh, more blocks later on. Now, uh, we do have a, a Mutavault out for blocking too if I need to. If I need to get that in there. So right now I could just on this go Spell Skite blocks the Icker Claw, Icker Claw pump which will mean I'll get one block on Icker Claw, which I couldn't have done if I blocked the... Oh, okay. And then we have our Silver Gill. Reveal Silver... Excuse me. Silver Gill. Okay. So the Glistener Elf is going to have to stay back, barring a pump spell, and even then, it has to be a pump spell that Spell Sky can't snatch, like Blossoming Defense. The Glistener Elf is, is going to hang back for a bit. Now, one thing that I'll note here, that his list needs, and I, it came up, even though I went 4-0, it came up a number of times, is that he does not have a Dryad Arbor in his list, even though it's a mono green list with, I think, seven, six or seven uh, green fetch lands, windswept, wooded, etc. Uh, but he doesn't have a Dryad Arbor. Okay, he's taking a call, so we're, uh, we're gonna let that go. Alright, he's gonna animate the Ink Moth. It would be nice to have a Dryad Arbor for a number of reasons. One, Solemnity is now a deck. Two, Surprise Blocker. Three, Liliana of the Veil is still a card. Four, just occasionally you get an extra creature out to, uh, uh, to... I had somewhere I was going with that, but then I started watching this play. Sorry about that, got a little, little bit distracted. Uh, just another creature to work with, let's say. Alright, so it looks like I'm letting both of those through. I can't stop the Ink Moth, and I'm just going to take one off of the Ick Claw because the trigger means that Silvergo Adept would not do the job on its own. So now I have a few choices here. 
I have, unless I play a land, I have three mana to work with, and it looks like yes, I do. So I could play a Lord, and that would make the Silver Gill on its own strong enough to deal with Icker Claw, which is a different dynamic entirely. Because now I can start one for one ing with Icker Claw Mirror, get, get it off the table. And plus, having a Lord will slowly increase the clock. It, it's not much, but with an Ink Moth Nexus on the board, I do have a clock. I do have to do something. And again, Blossoming Defense is a card, so I have to watch out for that. It's a 4 of in his list, unless he's... I don't think he's taken any out. I think this is the exact list I 4 out with, so... There are 4 Blossoming Defense, and in this day and age, or any for that matter, I would not go with fewer than 4 Blossoming Defense in Infect, regardless of... As long as it has green in it, as long as I can play a Glistener Elf, I'm going to play a Blossoming Defense, too. Alright. <coughs> Ooh, sorry. Ooh. One moment. <coughs> Ooh. Alright. Animating that Ink Moth again. But are we just going to attack with the Ink Moth? Because he sees what I see. He knows that if he attacks with Icker Claw, it's just going to trade with Silver Gill. He might want to keep it back on defense. And I do see that he has an Apostle's Blessing in hand, which, once again, Spellsky cannot steal. Alright, so we are chumping with the Silver Gill. We're going to make a nice little trade there. And that's fine by me for a number of reasons, not the least of which is he already know okay, there's the Apostle's Blessing. He already knows I have another Silver Gill. And I'm I'm checking to make sure it only it can't be stolen by Spellskite. Lo and behold, it cannot. You'd think a T1 Glistener Elf would remember that, and I did, but I guess I was just making sure. I don't know. It's uh it's been a while since I've gotten to play really serious competitive magic because again no collection that does make it kinda hard so we're gonna probably run out another silver yep there's the other silver gill reveal master of the pearl trident which uh, TJ's son Trey shout outs to Trey calls uh, butt cheek man because that particular art and I'm not aware of any other art for it uh, has two seashells on its belt hanging down such that a ten-year-old boy sees butt cheeks, and so therefore it is butt cheek man. This is this is canon now, Wizards of the Coast. This is canon. All right. Animate Ink Moth. You've seen this song and dance before, and that clock is slowly starting to tick up. We have our our little doomsday clock of Phyrexia. All right, what you got? I see a mutagenic growth. I see a necropede. Perhaps not the time for that. We'll do that main phase too. Okay. I think he's just going to swing with the ink moth, which is a pretty hard tell that he doesn't want to make the trade. And yet he doesn't have another blessing. So. We're seeing Necropede, Mutagenic Growth, yeah, that's as much as I saw just then. You can tell what he's debating most, most readily. No, he's swinging with everybody. I mean, he knows he's about to get blown out here. He didn't know about the Spatial Contortion, I'll grant him that. But for the other creatures, he knows he's about to lose him. Alright, he's going to mutagenic growth, I'm going to redirect to spell sky because, of course, and so his ink moth will not get saved, it's just going to go down to a, <laughs> a 4 negative 2, and state based actions don't like to see the number negative, so uh, at some point ink moth is about to go, but we're, we're resolving this first for some reason, so the silver, yeah, I'm, I'm pointing it out to him. Uh, the Silver God Adept is going to go up to Icker Claw, and good old Lord is going to block Glistener Elf. Take a minus one, minus one counter for the team, and we get a board wipe. 
And again, with the exception of Ink Moth Nexus, he knew that that was going to happen, so I'm not sure why he's doing this. Okay, so there is the Necropede, and he has gotten Lord of Atlantis within range of the Necropede's minus one, minus one counter. Mutavault. Excellent. Well, there is Butt Cheek Man. And another lord will save my lord. Well, sort of, if he blocks Lord Atlantis. Yeah. Okay, so... There's that. Now, if I'm gonna animate Mutavault, I might want to do it with the Mutavault that's summoning say Okay, there we go. And without that Ink Moth Nexus, I have all the time in the world. This is one of the advantages of running a list with six removal spells. You can more readily deal with creatures like that. And Warping Will and Spatial Contortion, they're both instant speed. So we are going to attack with the Lord of Atlantis and risk losing it here. He can block with the Necropede and then distribute the counter to Lord of Atlantis. And he'll be able to take that out. He'll one for one with me there. In the meantime, I'll be getting four damage off this Mutavault, which I guess he did not block. Okay, um, I'm not sure why. I imagine he has something up his sleeve. But you've got to have some Apostle's Blessing, triple blossoming defense. There we go, that's actually it. I, if I'm seeing that correctly and, he's at, and I'm at four poison counters, he would need triple blossoming defense. Or Cathedral of War could come in here, actually. Uh, Cathedral of War would give an extra one, plus the one Necropete already has, and two Blossoming Defense, and an Apostle's Blessing. That would be sick. That would be highlight-worthy. I would be jealous because I'm T1 Glistener Elf, and I need to get those plays. Alright. So we're just doing a merfolk thing, as you do, you know. As you can see, last turn I played the Curse Catcher. We're just going all in. This is the alpha swing. Is that what they call it? Alpha swing? We're, we're going aggro. Well, whatever. We're going aggro. Yeah. Yeah, Infect is not in a great spot here. Now, I will say that the spell skite here is not as effective in my list as it would be in a regular merfolk list. Not quite. And the reason is because, lo and behold, you don't have that many blue sources for non-merfolk in the deck, which means Spellskite's ability isn't as good. So, yeah, obviously you can pay two life, and that's what we care about. But, alternatively, every now and then you'll want to pay blue mana. Merfolk can do that more readily than mine can. Regular merfolk, I should say. And that's because, you know, it, it has multiple islands and, you know, breeding pool in the case of the Trop list. Okay, so we just concluded I had Master, Spatial Contortion, he had Forest, Rancor. Okay, so I, that Rancor is playing around. Real quick before I finish up with this, before I pull out my sideboard cards, uh, I like the Tropical list. Uh, I prefer it to be called Simic. Either way is fine. It's called Tropical Merfolk because of Tropical Island, the ABUR uh, duel that makes blue and green. I prefer Simic just because I prefer to use the guild names, but Tropical does sound more... Tropical. It sounds, it sounds more flavorful. So you see the Chalice of the Void that did not want to show up. How many? Four. On the other hand, the two Spellskites did show up. <laughs> Alright. So he took out Blossoming Defense. He, he must not be familiar with my version of the deck, which, to be fair, is a weird deck. Against traditional merfolk, Blossoming Defense hits double dismember, and that's about it. Okay, so he had two Blossoming Defense and three... Wait, 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 wait. I thought I had four Blossoming Defense in the main. Did you take them out? Well, whatever. Anyway, so two Spell Sky, two Spatial, because I had two Spatial in the side, which puts me up to eight removal spells in the deck. Uh, and then I took out Phantasmal Image, because he can kill it with pump spells. And Kapala, Warden of Waves, he doesn't have much removal. He doesn't have any removal, apparently, uh, outside of artifact removal. And... Um, I, I'm i sure I had some more I took out. I'm not seeing what they are. But uh, there you go. Yeah, he wanted Creeping Corrosion for dealing with Aether Vial and uh, Chalice and stuff like that. Because... Oh, okay. 
so because I don't have the regular island base, I can't play spreading seas, I can't play counter spells in my sideboard, so it's very artifact heavy, so the creeping corrosions here makes sense. Alright, that's it. Take care, Magic Community, and I will see you later. Bye-bye.